So we continue our series of Meet the Manager videos and we're delighted to be joined by Dan Mahoney from Polar Capital. Um, Dan uh, leads um, and is one of the, the lead fund managers um, on the Polar Capital um, healthcare team. We've had a, a pretty long-standing recommendation on their um, healthcare opportunities fund, which is one of their more flexible, growth oriented um, funds able to invest um, across the market cap spectrum. Um, Dan, again, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Um, we think the healthcare sector is a really interesting um, space to be looking at at the moment. Um, clearly, the kind of long-term drivers are still there, ageing population and, and that sort of thing, well, well documented. Um, but also, this point in the cycle, um, kind of less economically sensitive um, area of the market to, to be looking at. Um, but you've spoken a lot in your recent commentary about some of the disruptive and things going on in the sector. And I wondered in this interview if we could, if we could kind of um, talk through some of those. Um, the, the first of which, um, th this theme of um, the industry moving more towards a, um, a value-based reimbursement system yeah. rather than um, just simply based on, on volume. Um, I wondered if you can maybe explain um, what that term really means and some of the implications um, um, of that. I think partly when we go to a system that has electronic medical records, where everything can be documented, you can actually start seeing what doctors or medical professionals are doing, and then you can see the results of that, i.e. the outcomes. And so you can actually start evaluating the value of any treatment or therapy that's been administered to a patient. That's very different to how reimbursement systems have run for the last 20, 30 years, which have been based more on a fee-for-service. I go and see you as a doctor, and the doctor get pay gets paid a fee and no one really ascertains whether they've actually delivered any value or not. So can we kind of um, delve into that a little bit deeper? What are the ramifications for, for, for maybe some of the big pharma companies f from this change? Well, I think for pharma it's particularly uh, acute at the moment because I think historically we used to think about would a drug get approved? Would the clinical trial data be enough to get it through a regulator? You've now also got to think about do I have enough data to get it reimbursed either by a health insurance company or by a government. And those are two slightly different data sets. So a clinical trial often can be maybe 500 or 1,000 patients, whereas to get something reimbursed, I might need real-world data from 20, 30,000 patients who actually are real patients in the real world. So, so one of the big themes in this is the, um, the ability to now collect and, and analyse a, a much larger amount of data. Um, could, could I ask you for, for some of the, the kind of winners of that, of that trend? Who, who are the, um, the big beneficiaries of that? Well, we think the winners at the moment are the insurance companies because they're beginning to get a better feel of their cost basis. So an insurance company is difficult because you pay me a premium and I don't know what the cost of goods is. I don't know how sick you're going to be this year. But if I can start using data and analytics to, uh, in one sense, predict whether you're going to get ill, that would be the sort of nirvana, but more importantly, to make sure you get the most cost-effective care, then I've got a better feel of how to manage my cost line. And of course, that's difficult on an individual basis, but if I've got a book of business that has 50 million people, I kind of know I'm going to have, whatever it is, 10,000 heart attacks, and how I can get the best care and the best cost-effective care to those patients. And another big kind of structural change in the industry is the, um, the, the change in the, the point of delivery of care. Um, I wondered if you could maybe, maybe um, t touch on, on, on that structural change. Well, one of the things we've talked about is a battle for the front door of healthcare. So for nearly 100 years, most of us experience our access point of healthcare by going to the GP surgery in the UK. I mean, my GP surgery is pretty similar to the one when I was a boy, which is a bit bad, really, because I'm a lot older than I look. But um, I think what we're beginning to see is new access points, which on the one hand are purely driven by technology, like telehealth. So there are companies in the UK which are private at the moment, like Babylon Health or Push Doctor, that offer that service. But we're also seeing companies like CVS in the US, which is a large pharmacy chain, similar to Boots, offering the pharmacy as a new access point to care, so that you actually go straight to the pharmacy, either get advice from the pharmacist or a nurse who is in the back of, in a clinic at the back of the pharmacy, or if the nurse can't answer the question, they open up an iPad and you've got a video call with a doctor. So again, it's technology disrupting the way that healthcare is actually being delivered. So you probably get the same quality of care, but it's delivered in the cheapest cost setting. 
Um, we just had a, an update meeting pri prior to this, and um, another theme that you talked about was the, the empowerment of, of the consumer in, in the industry now. Um, and I, you actually mentioned an interesting um, uh, example from a product from Abbott Labs. I wondered if you could, if, if you could just touch on that as well. Yeah. So, so we think there's an emergence of uh, the democratised health market. Uh, is a new market opportunity that in some respects sits between the consumer and professional healthcare. And so Abbott has launched a product four years ago called Freestyle Libre, which is uh, it's a little disc with a pin in it that you can put in your arm. It's for diabetics. And it effectively measures your blood sugar almost in real time. And so for a diabetic, um, that's really helpful. If I've just eaten a meal or exercised or get up in the morning feeling a bit groggy, I would like to know what's going on inside him. Is my sugar low? Is it high? What's going on? Um, what's interesting about Libre is Abbott sold a billion dollars of that product last year, which for a medical device company is a mega blockbuster. And interestingly, we estimate probably 250 to 300 million dollars of those sales we think were out of pocket in Europe, which means you've got European patients who are used to having all their healthcare paid for for free actually going and buying it off the Abbott website. Now, the starter pack is 150 quid, which you know, is not, not a lot of money, but you know, it's not cheap. But it shows you how motivated those patients are to get more data to help them live a normal life. And I think that is the beginnings of a democratised health market, people taking control and paying for it themselves. Just as one last question, we talked a lot about the kind of um, digitalisation of, um, of some areas of the industry and, and technology in the innovation from that respect. In terms of medical innovation, we've seen um, quite a lot of progress in the areas of things like uh, gene and cell therapies. Um, is it, is it po possible to play that, that new innovation in a portfolio like, like yours? And, and, and if so, how are, you, how are you doing that? So, yes, we can play that. We tend to play that on a... Well, there are two ways of playing it. So... We sometimes invest in the smaller biotech companies who are actually leading that innovation. Now, you have to be careful there because the risk reward of those companies you have to manage. Uh, anybody who's invested biotech in biotech personally knows that stocks go up as well as go down. The other way is you can invest in some of the bigger companies who've actually gone out and acquired the smaller companies. So, for example, Novartis last year spent nearly eight, nine billion dollars on a company called Avexis to get hold of a gene therapy platform that treats, uh, well, hopes to treat a number of childhood diseases which are really nasty. Gene therapy means you kind of put a gene back that for whatever reason is missing or is mutated in, in often a young child. Sure. Dan, really interesting to talk to you as always. Thanks very much for coming in. Thanks a lot. If you'd like any um, further information on the Polar Capital Healthcare Opportunities Fund, please contact your investment manager for a copy of our recent research notes. Thanks very much.